Well, thank you everybody for coming over this morning. Um, I'm very happy to have today um, uh, Jesse Thomason from University of Washington uh, giving us a talk on vision and dialogue navigation. Jesse is a postdoc with Luke and he was a student of uh, Ray Mooney's uh, at UT Austin. Um, and we're very excited to see all his latest, greatest stuff at the intersection of NLP and robotics. Right. Cool. Uh, we're good to start. Uh, thanks, Dave, for the introduction. Uh, again, I'm Jesse Thomason. I've flashed up here some of my collaborators for the two papers I'll be talking about today. Um, Dan Gordon, uh, Yonatan Bisk, who is another uh, postdoc working with Yejin Choi. Michael Murray is a full-time engineer at Amazon, who moonlights as a master's student at UW. And then Maya Chakmak and Luke Zettelmoy are the two PIs who helped out. Um, generally, this talk is about bringing, or motivated by bringing robots out of industrial spaces and into human spaces. So generally, when we think of robotics uh, as they're currently deployed, they typically are in places that are dangerous for humans. They do machine work, they work behind glass and barriers. Um, and transitioning them into human spaces is happening. So we have robots now that are for moving luggage around in hotels, or there's uh, companies like Diligent Robotics in Austin working on bringing robots into hospitals. Uh, for the purposes of doing medical packing and delivering things to patients' rooms. And these are very cool applications, and we'd like to see them succeed. Uh, but there are a number of challenges to get the robots from industrial space into human spaces safely and conveniently. Uh, those include natural language, because we use language to speak to one another. It's very likely we'd like to use it to speak to robots as well. Navigation, because in an uncontrolled environment where humans are moving around, moving furniture, opening and closing doors, robots no longer have the ability to sort of have full state information about what's going on, which can actually happen even on like a factory floor like we see here. Uh, because the robots are the only things in the environment, they can be reasonably sure about their own location and everyone else's. Also, you can just put Vicons all around to track them, which we can't reasonably do in any human spaces. Um, and then also robust perception. The uh, onboard sensors need to be enough to detect what's going on in the environment. Um, and these are not things I'm going to focus on in this talk uh, because roboticists happily are working on it instead of me. I'm going to focus on the top two, which is uh, communicating our intents to robots using natural language and ensuring that robots can take that intent and translate it into coherent navigation actions. So in human spaces, we do use natural language, and we've already started to use it to communicate with digital assistants like Alexa, Siri, Google, and Cortana. Um, and we've invited these things into our homes in the form of uh, physically embodied uh, personal assistants like the Echo Dot and the Google Home. And these systems typically use dialogue to clarify human intent. If we ask uh, the Google Home, for instance, to play David Bowie, it will probably play Major Tom. And if it doesn't, it will ask what album or what song should I play to fill in the missing information. Um, and using this sort of dialogue-based strategy to fill in uh, missing info is something that we'll focus on uh, repeatedly throughout the talk. The second challenge is that human spaces are dynamic. That is, humans move around a lot, we open and close doors, we can move furniture, uh, and they can also be unseen. So in the case of a robot that is operating in a hospital, or a hotel, presumably this is a more or less fixed location in terms of floor plan. We could map it in advance, get a nice LiDAR scan of the whole place, and then do planning to do navigation, and that's fine. Um, but when we deploy to a new hospital, or if we deploy a robot in, say, a research environment like an office, this is the robot used at UT Austin, we'd prefer that they be able to actually do this without pre-mapping the environment, just show up and start navigating, uh, which means we need to be robust in unseen environments as well. So I'm going to quickly outline the talk. I'm going to start with discussing uh, language grounding and visual environments in general. Um, and that is just connecting language and vision uh, for the purposes of either visual question answering or navigation, various applications. Uh, then I'll talk about for navigation specifically. Uh, I'll talk about a paper that uh, we have at NACL this year on unimodal bias that can occur in these navigation data sets. This is well established in data sets like VQA that uh, things like just reading the question without looking at the image can give you really strong performance. It turns out that also happened in a bunch of navigation data sets that came out last year. Uh, then I'll move on and talk about the main point of the talk, vision and dialogue navigation, which is a new paradigm. Uh, for that, I've released a new data set, um, and the paper is under review now. Uh, and then I'll talk about a particular task, which is performing navigation, especially in unseen environments, based not on a high-level instruction from a human, but on an actual dialogue history that a robot could have with a person. 
And then we'll talk about next steps for that data set and for this line of research in general. So I'm going to first talk about language grounding and visual environments. Um, again, this is generally just connecting uh, language, which is sort of a high-level specification, with vision, which is low-level pixels, right? These are sort of uh, intuitively incompatible, but people have done a lot of research on how to put them together. And the common paradigm is that you have as input language tokens, for example, a question about a photograph, and then some visual context, like the photograph you need to answer the question about. This is the paradigm for visual question answering uh, from 2015. And those visual co uh, contexts can differ in quality across data sets. We could have actual photographs or, say, renderings, like what's done with the Clever data set. And the output can be a single classification, like an answer to a question, or it can be a sequence of uh, things, like actions. If we ask a question in an actual simulation environment, the agent might need to move through that environment before being able to answer the question, in which case we have a sequence rather than a single class. So I'm going to define... Uh, uh, related works that sort of stand out to me um, in the field. There's a lot that I won't talk about, um, but these are sort of placeholders for them, uh, across two axes. One is visual fidelity, which is, again, ranging from rendered environments that are not necessarily realistic to actual photorealistic environments or actual photographs um, on the y-axis there. And then on the x-axis, we have visual context, which is static, that being single photos versus dynamic, actually interacting with an environment. So I talked briefly about the Clever data set. This is um, questions about uh, rendered photographs. Um, so the renderings are quite good, but they are artificial. I and mean, we can ask questions like, what is, the sphere made, what is the largest sphere made of? And the answer would be a single classification. It's made of metal. There's also visual question answering with real photographs where we can ask things like, what is the mustache made of? And the answer is banana. And this is real photographs, but again, just a single answer. Moving into dynamic environments, um, if we go way back to AAAI 2011, um, we have Chin and Mooney's instruction following data set, which is an agent moving through a simulated uh, set of series of hallways, taking discrete like left and right actions to do turns, moving forward in the hall. And it's quite low fidelity. The, the thing is set up with like big murals that show fish and the Eiffel Tower and butterflies to sort of serve as landmarks. Um, so it's somewhere between doing actual perception and sort of semantically segmented perception. Um, and to the degree that they could actually do semantic parsing to solve it. Those were the days. Um, more recently, we have dynamic environments that are also photorealistic. And this sort of took off um, in earnest last year at CVPR 2018 with the room-to-room -room data set from Pete Anderson and his group. We're going to focus a lot on that data set throughout the talk, both because um, it exhibits some unimodal bias and because it's what we build on uh, for a vision and dialogue navigation data set that I'll present. So let's talk about these navigation data sets. Uh, CVPR 18 was sort of a boon for this. Um, again, we're going to talk primarily about uh, the Matterport navigation. This is the vision and language navigation paradigm. Um, uh, Matterport is this uh, company that does house scans. They were contracted by a real estate uh, company to go through, scan these like big, horrifyingly large mansions, and then do visual reconstruction so that people who were also very rich could walk through the mansions and decide whether or not they wanted to go out and visit them in person or buy them. Um, it also means rubes like me can walk through them in the simulation environment and know that I'll never have this much money. As researchers, what it means is that we have a discrete navigation graph. Everywhere the camera was placed to capture pieces of the scene, we can put an agent that can swivel around like the 3D camera did and look at everything um, from that uh, vantage point. You can actually see the camera and the reflection of the glass right there. Um, so we can create an agent that has discrete actions like swiveling left and right, up and down, and moving forward to other navigation nodes. And Pete Anderson and their group put together um, this room-to-room -room navigation data set where you take uh, small trajectories through the environment, five or six navigation hops, uh, and they have mechanical Turk workers go through and annotate those with long, low-level language instructions, like here, leave the bedroom and enter the kitchen, walk forward and take a left at the couch, stop in front of the window. Um, and using that, the objective is to take in the language and the current position and then uh, infer these navigation actions to get closer to the goal node that's described in language. Um, so to take that out of the GIF world and into sort of a visual abstraction, um, we have a low-level language instruction. So say we're at this node in the, language, in the uh, navigation graph, and we can see these books on a library shelf. 
if our instruction is something like turn around and exit the library, head down the hall to the whatever, our goal is to take these discrete navigation steps and arrive to a goal node that is described, whose, the path to which is described through this long low-level natural language instruction. Now note that we're describing the actual path and not the destination. You could imagine telling a robot, hey, go to the room with that big spirally potted plant. But that's considerably harder because then you're not telling it the steps it needs to take to actually get there. Um, that difference ends up being quite important later on in the talk. But note for now that we're giving actual path descriptions to the robot. So the initial paper on room to room uh, uses a sequence to sequence model as an initial baseline for this task. Um, and it's quite good uh, at um, capturing the information necessary to, to solve the task. Um, you basically encode the language tokens and then use that to initialize the state of a decoder that infers navigation actions in the environment. So more concretely, you learn a language embedding for the tokens in the environment. You can imagine using pre-trained word vectors as well. Turns out that's not always what you want to do because left and right are nearest neighbors and, it, and in actual embodied space, uh, you want to learn representations that are quite different from them. Um, those are fed into an LSTM encoder that initializes the state of an LSTM decoder, machine translation style. And at every time step, that decoder takes in a fixed um, ResNet processed embedding of the visual frame. You can, of course, imagine more complicated ways to do that as well. Um, but this works well enough. It basically captures whatever salient objects are in the scene um, and then output a navigation action. And continue doing that until the action is to stop because you believe you've arrived at the destination. We're going to build on this model throughout the talk, uh, primarily for the purposes of comparison and because it provides a nice initial baseline that is not dumb and leaves lots of headroom for additional more nuanced modeling. It's quite small. Um, it's just left, right, up, down, forward, and stop. So there's six possible actions, and forward is by far and away the most common one that the agent ends up taking. Because for the most part, when you're facing a direction, you sort of continue walking in that direction. Um, that turns out to be really problematic for unimodal bias, uh, as I'll talk about in a second. Um, so it's trained to predict uh, the action that a shortest path planner would take to the goal node. So say we're at our initial library point. We have our instruction, you know, turn around and exit the library. Um, we've taken in the language instruction, and we predict, this is a distribution over uh, the logits of the actions uh, for forward, left, right, up, down, and end, that we should move forward further into the library. A shortest path planner has full state information. So it can see the whole graph. It knows where the destination is. It knows the shortest path, and it can say, hey, you kept going into the library, but you really should have turned right because we need to be working on exiting uh, instead. So we can basically train against this signal. And again, this looks a lot like the machine translation setup where we know what we want to be decoding to. And if you decode to the wrong thing, you can use that as a supervision signal. So uh, at CVPR last year, there was sort of a boon for this vision and language navigation paradigm. In particular, on the far left, uh, this room-to-room -room data set came out where we have this long, low-level language instruction, and we get new visual frames at every time step to infer navigation actions. And the goal is just to arrive at the goal, at the uh, goal node. Uh, two other data sets came out that were quite similar, um, embodied question answering and interactive question answering, shown in the middle and on the right. And there, rather than getting this long, low-level language instruction, you just get a high-level question. So in EQA, here in the middle, you might be asked, what color is the car? And there's no car in the scene, so you have to take navigation actions to exit the house, walk around the side, find the garage, see the car in the frame, and then answer. Um, in interactive question answering, the spaces are smaller, but there's a little bit more photorealism in the environment. You might be asked, how many apples are in the kitchen? You have to walk around the kitchen, open and close cabinets, check the fridge, until you're reasonably sure you've seen all the apples and say, there are three apples. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on the fact that in all of these uh, situations, you have language and visual frames as input, and you output some series of navigation actions. And we'll sort of ignore the fact that you have to answer the question in the end um, for the purposes of, of this analysis. So that brings me to unimodal bias. Um, all three of these data sets were released around the same time. Um, VLN, the room to room navigation data set, became wildly popular. We can talk about uh, later on how many submissions it's had and how far we've gotten towards human performance on it just in the last year. Um, EQA enjoyed a brief spurt of popularity and ran into some copyright issues. Uh, we don't have to go into that, but 
Um, they did exhibit some issues too before those things happened. So in particular, let's think about what the input and output of this task look like. We always get language tokens that tell us um, some discrete set of actions that need to be taken. So we're going to do a really short um, path here. Our language is walk past the bar and turn right. And this is time steps one, two, three, and four. And let's say that at four we've, we've accomplished what was described in this little instruction here. So there's the bar. We're going to walk forward until we get to the wall, turn, walk forward, and now we're done. So we can consider um, what the navigation actions themselves look like at every time step. Um, in particular, we're predicting we should keep walking forward, then we should turn right and walk forward again. And note that at time step three, because we're up against the wall, the simulator environment can tell us, oh, you actually can't walk forward here, even though you think you should continue doing so. At every time step, we're getting both a visual observation and feedback from the environment that says what actions are available. You can basically think of this as um, if you're moving through the simulation environment, you can sort of have a sensor on the front of the robot that says, like, you can't walk forward anymore. In fact, that's all, like, Roombas do to do navigation, right? They find out that they've bumped a wall and say, okay, I can't walk forward here anymore. It's a reasonable thing to get from a simulator. It's also problematic because now if we take away language and just say, all right, here you are facing the bar, what should you do? Your prior tells you, if I'm facing forward, keep walking forward. You walk forward till you hit the wall. There's like a dining table over here, so probably you don't turn left. So you turn right, walk a little bit more, and now you're done. And you've like succeeded. What if there's no visual input? Well, again, assume you're facing the right direction. Start walking forward. And then when you discover that you can't walk forward anymore, guess whether to turn left or right. Now you've got a 50% chance of being correct. If you turn right, you've uh, moved to the correct place. And finally, you could remove both language and vision. Now the agent at every time step is only getting what actions are available, and then of course because it's an encoder-decoder model, it knows what it did in the past. It has some notion of history of what its path has been so far. So it can memorize average trajectories. You don't walk forward and then immediately walk backwards. You don't turn in circles. Um, and consequently, if you just keep walking forward, find out you've hit a wall, pick left or right, again, you've got a 50% shot in this uh, small example of getting the right answer. Um, this sort of intuitively seems like a problem, and I'll show objectively that it is. Through unimodal model ablations, yes? Um, how do you, if you take away both language and vis uh, vision, mm -hmm. uh, how do you communicate the goal to, to the agent in the scenario where both of them are out? Mm -hmm. There's no communication. It's so, just dropped into a starting point. And, yeah. and then it just takes, do whatever you can, and then does it receive a reward that you succeeded in reaching there? Yeah, so d we do supervised training still. So what happens is um, at every time step, if it took the wrong action, the shortest path planner says, oh, you went forward, you should have turned okay. right. So, so that's how you're communicating yeah. preferences. That's right. What, what is right, what is wrong. That's right. And what it means is you can think about it as learning the average trajectory through a given house for instance, and then it's not aware of what house it's in either. So really you're learning the average trajectory through Matterport-style navigation graphs. Yeah. Um, and if the average trajectory turns out to look about the same across all of these different instances, then you do very well. Um, what we'll show concretely is this does like way better than a random baseline, which is what they compare it to in the paper. It blows it out of the water. Even if you have no input at all, right, which is... Um, so we're going to perform unimodal model ablations by just piecewise uh, zeroing out inputs from different pieces of the same architecture. So in room to room, um, like I just said, even the action only model beats the initial baseline. They initially just had um, an agent that picked a random direction and walked the average length of a trajectory, which seems totally sensible. Um, but training with only vision, only language, or nothing at all does better than a truly random non-learning agent, which suggests that this should have been the baseline that was used in the first place, right? Take whatever model you want to release, remove vision and language, see how you do. If you still do really well, your model might not be multimodal. It might just be overfitting some priors in your data set. On embodied question answering, the uh, baseline model was, again, a random agent that took a random action in the environment. And again, ablating out vision, language, or both still results in better performance than a truly random non-learning agent. In interactive QA, um, the authors tried to balance uh, the data set a little more carefully. They have like a uniform distribution over destinations and starting points. Consequently, it's not quite as weak to these things, but still a vision-only model is better than conditioning on language. Part of this intuitively is just that if you zero out one modality, 
the rest of your network still exists, so you basically have a high capacity network receiving one input, and you can end up overfitting to that input. Because the visual environment in interactive QA is not particularly dynamic, it's all kitchens, the visual component can overfit at training time and become really good at just figuring out where stuff in kitchens is. So here's the truly problematic part, though. So these are just baselines, right? They should have evaluated against unimodal ablations. That's what I argue for in this paper. Um, but particularly, the issue is that um, they can also beat the initial model that was released. So if you take the initial Matterport model, you train it using only language, and then test it in inference time, it does better than if you had considered vision. And again, this is because it's a high capacity model. They can take in all those language instructions, use all the parameters it was wasting on vision for memorizing language, and it's being given low level instructions, right? Like turn around, exit the library, go down the hallway. If you're in a house you've never been in before, those things still correspond to like turn right five steps, move forward three steps, turn left, etc. It's being told to them what to do in the language. In embodied question answering, the vision only model is better. Uh, and again, uh, this is high-level questions like, what color is the car? That won't necessarily transfer to a new environment. But what will is the fact that these are very simple, like Sun CG rendered environments. The test time houses look the same as the training time houses. Consequently, if you only have vision, you can overfit to this simplistic, non-photorealistic environment and do a good job even if you don't know what you're looking for. None of these things happen in uh, interactive QA because of their intentional data set balancing. So again, our takeaways here are low-level language means that um, in the Matterport environment, we're able to, at test time, do just as well as we did uh, at training using only the language input modality. But the photorealistic environment makes it robust against a vision-only baseline. By contrast, in embodied QA, they use simple visual environments, which means the vision-only baseline can uh, outperform the full model that has the same architecture. Um, but they use high-level language, which means a language-only baseline is not sufficient. We don't learn anything from interactive QA. If you balance your data sets well, I won't exploit them for a talk. So our lessons. Unimodal baselines expose data set bias. Everybody should use them. If you don't ablate your models, you might trick yourself into thinking they're multimodal when they're really not. Uh, they're more appropriate than non-learning baselines always. I just believe this now. Except maybe SLAM. Um, rich visual context prevents visual overfitting, which is a good thing to do, so photorealistic environments are better. An underspecified language context prevents language overfitting, so it would be better not to use low-level instructions. Also, low-level instructions are kind of unnatural. If we're imagining eventually telling this to a robot, you wouldn't put a robot in your house and say, all right, turn right, go past the bar, turn left and go into the bathroom, then turn left again and stop there. You'd say, like, go in the bathroom and wait by the shower or something like that, right? So why can't we have both photorealistic environments and underspecified language? We'll explore that in the next segment of the talk which is a new data set, vision and dialogue navigation, which I have under submission now. So here, again, we're going to return to our navigation graph, and we have this low-level instruction, turn around, exit the library, go down the hall. Um, this Matterport environment uses this kind of low-level language, and it's been really successful. I don't want to sound like I'm disparaging Room to Room and the Matterport data set. They did a really amazing job getting people to care about this problem. They got the vision community to use language. These papers have started showing up at like NACL and ACL too. It's an awesome problem. Um, and we did really well on it. From when it was released, the initial model performed at 24% of human performance. That's been up to 80% at the latest state-of-the-art model. Um, so we're approaching like how well humans can do on the task. And humans themselves are only at like 85, 90% performance. Um, so it's not even clear that the agents aren't correctly following instructions and that the instructions are now the problem, uh, which could be the case. So it's also time for a paradigm change. Like this has been great, but having low level instructions to move through a discrete graph is maybe just a little bit too easy for the models we have now. So what if we replaced it with go to the room with the plant, like we described earlier. Just tell it uh, where you want it to be. Um, then we need to infer how to get to that space. Um, and if you've been in the house before, maybe this is a reasonable thing to say. Like, I know where the room with the plant is, I know where I am now. If you have full state information, you can definitely just make a shortest path plan and walk there, right? Um, but especially in houses that are staged for sale, there's a lot of rooms with plants, the instruction is ambiguous. The person who said, go to a room with the plant, has a room in mind, but that's not observable to the robot. And it's not even really realistic for a human, right? We would have to ask. Like, do you mean the room where the plant's by the window or where it's on the table, et cetera? Um, this is simply too hard of a problem if we scope it out this much. Um, and as people, again, what we would do is ask for clarification. So what if 
we navigate for a while, get to our first juncture. We know there's a room with a plant to the left and to the right, and we ask a question to the person who directed us. Should I continue into the living room or go towards the kitchen? And then if they say, oh, yeah, go left into the living room, because they know eventually they need to arrive here. That would be sufficient. So adding dialogue as a component has made question answering more complicated in general for several of these data sets. So uh, Clever uh, released Clever Dialogue at NACL this year. Um, and there, we have these same kinds of initial questions, like what shape is the yellow object, for instance? Um, and then the second question, and its material, requires you to look back at the dialogue and uh, use that for co-reference resolution. Similarly, in VQA, VizDial, the visual dialogue data set, uh, had humans playing the game. Uh, in Clever, it's, again, templates generating these questions, so it's inherently not as interesting to an NLP crowd. Um, but in VizDial, these were human-human games, and people say things like, what is she doing, as a question, which requires you to look back at the past context and figure out which she is being referred to. And that's one, two utterances back, the one in the white shirt, right? And then we can answer the question. Um, so this is more complicated. It involves longer language histories, at least. Maybe it starts to ameliorate some of the issues that we have with um, low-level language. Uh, when we move into the navigation environment, it gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, they can be dynamic and they can be photorealistic, but they differ on different axes. So I'm going to do a quick axial shift towards the language side of things and consider on the y-axis whether the language is templated or not versus human language on the bottom and what level of guidance abstraction we use, which is if we ask questions to a guide of some sort, does the guide see what we see or do they have some sort of more omniscient view of the world that allows them to answer the question in a different way? So a paper from last year, Talk the Walk, out of some folks from FAIR, uh, takes the approach of having a guide that has a higher level of abstraction. They have a sort of semantic abstraction of an environment. So a person is walking around on the street, and they can ask questions, um, and they're trying to get to a goal. So they say, hey, I'm in front of a Brooks Brothers. And the guide can't see Brooks Brothers. They can only see things like restaurants, banks, theaters, this higher level semantic abstraction that has nothing to do with the actual visual scene. And the person says, is that a shop or a restaurant? It's a clothing shop. All right, so they've grounded to shop, not to the fact that this is like a green building behind a white car, which is sort of what the agent is actually seeing. It would be much more interesting from a language perspective. But it was human-human. Uh, by contrast, we have work out of MSR, um, Day and Bill, et cetera, uh, who do things where an agent can instead perform an action that says, hey, I'm lost and I need some help. And then a guide who effectively sees the same visual environment, it's still egocentric, provides uh, a templated response in the form of what actions should be taken next, wrapped in natural language, like turn 60 degrees right, then go forward and turn left. But the sweet spot is sort of having this shared visual context and having human-human dialogue. So what I'm going to introduce is the vision and dialogue navigation paradigm, where we do have human-human dialogues where both the person doing navigation and the person answering questions uh, have the same visual context, leading to these sort of egocentric referring expressions about what you should do with your body. So for that, I released the Cooperative Vision and Dialogue Navigation Dataset. That's 2,000 human-human dialogues. Um, and we're going to flash forward. We're going to use the same initial model that Room to Room used, and I'll show that this dataset does not exhibit the same unimodal issues that uh, the Room to Room dataset has as a consequence of gathering language in this way. So we have two mechanical Turk workers connect to an interface. Uh, one plays the role of a navigator, and one plays the role of an oracle. And they're both shown a hint. Our hint here is the goal room contains a mat. Neither knows intuitively where the mat room is, but humans have priors. Like we know the mat is probably in a bathroom, or it's maybe a rug in front of a living room. So we know a little bit about what we're looking for as people. And it's reasonable for a robot to know those things too, even in a home it's never been in before. So a navigator, shown in blue, takes some initial navigation steps looking for the map until they get to a juncture. And then they can ask a question, into the hall or into the office. Then the oracle takes over. It's a turn-taking turn game. So the oracle can now uh, view, they have a privileged view, of what the shortest path planner would do next. And they view that as a fly-through, so it's still egocentric through the environment. So they see, okay, here's the next five steps that the planner would take. And they, it sort of goes down the hall and into some living room. They communicate that information back to the navigator using natural language. So left into the hall, follow it to a living room. The navigator takes over again. They continue until they have another question. So I'm going to show what this looks like live. Um, 
this is me playing uh, against myself so that I can do a full screen capture. I don't think it's a true conversation, but we'll show a bunch of real conversations too. So we have the navigator on the left and the oracle on the right. I'm going to start with the navigator um, moving around the environment. They can sort of click and drag to pan the camera. This simulates being able to pan left, right, up, and down. And they can click on these cylinders to move to a new navigation uh, viewpoint. These are the discrete navigation nodes in the environment. Now, the oracle can see what the navigator is doing, but they can't see the cylinders. Part of that is just so they don't say things like, oh, click the cylinder on your left, right? We want them to actually describe uh, in a, a fully um, visually grounded way. So when the navigator asks a question, the oracle can hit this button to show the best route. They can do that as many times as they want to see what the planner would do next. And then they just describe the route that they're seeing back to the navigator. And that whole time the navigator sits here and gets mad and maybe sends me an email that says the oracle is taking too long to respond. So I impose time limits eventually. Um, and then it works a little bit better. So two sort of concrete things. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Does the navigator, uh, the oracle, I'm sorry. Does the Oracle have access to a map so that they know they have the full information, or are they only looking at that? The Oracle at any given time can only see the next five steps, and only when it's their turn. So they don't, neither player knows what the goal looks like in advance. Um, part of the reason for that is if I show the Oracle the whole path all the way to the goal, for instance, there's nothing stopping them from trying to use natural language to describe the entire path. And then we are reduced back to room to room, which is long, low-level instructions that tell us what to do. Here, at least, we have a sort of piecewise version of that. Yeah. So the Oracle is free to reveal information about the next five steps. Yes. Yes. And they themselves only have access to that, so that's all they're able to reveal. To reveal. Yeah. Yes. Is success a task to find uh, possibly wandering around and doing wrong things, but then eventually finding your target and executing the end action? That's right. Yeah, so you'll note the navigator has this button um, that they found the goal. Uh, if they click that early, all that happens is they're not allowed to navigate anymore and they have to ask a question. Um, but the dialogue continues. Yeah. And a dialogue is entered into the data set initially if they actually reach the goal room. Uh, I do a lot of pruning after that to remove things like what you're describing where maybe they do the wrong thing for a long time. Um, and in general, getting people to behave at this task is hard. Uh, this is maybe more to the point. Um, I find that you can't necessarily trust an individual Turker until you've vetted them a lot, but you can trust them to tattle on each other. So what happens at the end of this is the navigator gives the oracle a rating. They say, on a scale of one to five, my oracle was this much helpful and like provided this many good instructions. Uh, and the oracle, uh, complementarily, tells the, uh, gives a rating to the navigator for did they follow instructions, did they ask good questions. Like if the navigator just sends them question mark or like where next, they typically get low ratings because that's a boring thing to say and they're instructed not to do it. Um, so I can basically track over time if a person's rating falls, and then I throw them out of the hit, and then I can retroactively clean up the dialogues where they got bad uh, ratings from their partners. Which means, in general, I only end up with 2,000 dialogues instead of the, like, 3.5 thousand I collected, but they're all pretty high quality. Yeah? And you use those ratings also to establish quality of the questions Sure, trustworthiness, for sure. Trustworthiness yeah. yeah, so in the data set release, we have these annotations on a per dialogue basis, not just what did the person receive in this game, but what was their average over all games. So you can sort of say, like, all right, this is from a Turker that I trust, so I'm going to trust this data for my supervised training, right, more than this. Um, in our initial models, we're going to use all of it, of course. Um, but yeah, there's nothing stopping people from doing additional filtering or sort of uh, maybe even weighting the gradients by how much Turkers trusted each other, right? Any more questions about the interface? At the end, I'm going to let you guys play with it instead of doing question and answer if you want to. So, Is the Oracle um, requested in any way to use low-level, to not use low-level uh, descriptions? No. So the Oracle is told <clears throat> to be specific and low-level, actually. So the high-level language component here comes in the form of the hint. So find a room with a mat is high-level, describes nothing about the path. But what we have instead is when lost, can we get a short description of a path? So we basically have descriptions that describe five steps worth of path in different points throughout the house, right? What kind of visual attributes are available for communication, like colors, you know, textures, or shapes, or something like that, or is it pretty? I mean, it's it's uh, these photorealistic houses. So t people typically use actual like salient objects. Um, there's like a there's a house with a Christmas tree where like Christmas tree spikes on my uh, word models. 
Um, people tend to use whatever the most visually salient thing is. Every now and then they make chit chat with each other about interesting art. Um, so it's a bit noisy, but typically they use landmarks, yeah, as opposed to just strict color. What is the oracle instructed to say if the uh, other player gets all the way to the goal, mm -hmm. standing in front of the map, for instance, but they, they haven't said done yet? Yeah. And will the oracle say, you're there? This yeah, often they do. Um, so we do this annotation, uh, uh, I can talk about it at the Q&A if you want to have the tables for it, where we annotate like a hundred random dialogues, and one of the phenomena I noticed and then started tracking is whether or not they do explicit confirmation with each other. Like the navigator will say, okay, am I here? And then the oracle says, yes, now you should click the button. Um, some of them are just afraid to click it. Other ones do the game theoretically optimal thing of clicking the button that says they're done every single time because there's no penalty, and then being forced to ask a question only if they're wrong. Um, so some games end really abruptly because the navigator got lucky. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, they're trying to get paid as fast as possible. So some of them learn. Okay. So using this dialogue paradigm uh, leads to long paths and rich language compared, especially to the room-to-room -room data from which we build. So here on the x-axis, I have the path length. Uh, through the environment. In blue is how long it took humans to get there, and in gold is what the shortest path planner would do. This is also one of the metrics we can use to prune dialogues out of the data set. If you say, hey, this human obviously just took way too long to get to the goal, you don't have to use it in training. Um, but you can see they range, uh, even in the shortest path setting, up to about 35 in length. And the average is 17.4, which is well over three times uh, the room-to-room -room average of six hops through the graph. So these are longer in general, and if you train against human paths, they're much, much longer. Uh, there's also more words in general. There's more language context. So we see on the x-axis now number of words spoken by the oracle versus the navigator in blue and gold. Um, navigators tend to say less because they are more or less offering options where the oracles are actually describing paths. So there's a longer tail of uh, long oracle utterances. And again, uh, the average total words per dialogue is about 82 versus even with low-level instructions coming from room to room, uh, about 30 words. And again, that's about three times longer. Uh, this is the number of utterances per dialogue. So two utterances would be a question and then an answer. This is question-answer exchanges effectively along the x-axis and then frequency again. Um, on average, the dialogues run between two and three question-answer exchanges, so four to six utterances. Um, and this is sort of a, a typical middling range dialogue. This is a length six, I think. Um, so the goal room contains a rug, and then the navigator walks three steps before they ask a question. They say, should I go right or, le or left or right? And the oracle says, go left and turn right after the bathroom. Navigator takes four steps. This continues. Um, sometimes the navigator walks further than five, sometimes fewer than five. It depends on the quality of the instruction, but we know every time that the oracle was actually shown five steps in the future. And then eventually the navigator re reaches the goal uh, and the oracle has told them, stop at the room with a brown chair, which they do without asking anything else. And this is a real example, not one that I cooked up for the purposes of a video. So I've highlighted in blue now the, what the shared visual context buys us, which is these like series of egocentric referring expressions like to the left or right, go left and turn right, uh, on the right, um, toward the front door, all of which don't happen if you do something like the talk the walk data I mentioned earlier where the guide gave um, instructions given the semantic abstraction. There you're never going to have like go towards the front door because the semantic map doesn't have a front door, right? It just has landmarks. Um, so we get a lot more visual referring expressions uh, and spatial referring expressions by doing this. So let me talk about a concrete task we can carve out of this. There's a lot of things I want to do with this data set. I've done one for the submission so far, um, and that's to carve out 7,000 dialogue-based navigation um, steps that sort of look like the room-to-room -room challenge, and we can use the same architecture for it. So given this dialogue, um, what we can do is at every oracle answer, we know that the oracle took was shown five steps, and the navigator took however many steps they took. And we can use either of these as supervision. So we know the oracle is describing these five steps, and we know that given the history so far, this is what the navigator chose to do. And they typically use some exploration um, using human intuition and using the dialogue history. So we can slide a window and say, well, if we're only given the hint, we should be able to walk at least the three steps the human did. If we're given the first QA pair, we should be able to walk the four steps the human did. At every uh, slice of this dialogue, our input is the history so far and the visual frames at every time step, and our output is going to be navigation actions to get new visual frames. And the goal will always be to get closer to the target object room, given whatever dialogue history we have so far. 
So at every one of these steps, we're still trying to get to the room with the rug um, about how far we can realistically get um, changes as the dialogue moves on. And we can turn, do that uh, to turn 2,000 dialogues into 7,000 task instances by sliding this window and getting, for example, five instances out of this single dialogue of navigation conditioned on history so far. You guys follow this? Okay, how yes. Do you measure how close you are to the target object from sort of like a disk? It's a number of hops through the navigation graph, um, and the graphs are actually weighted by meters. So what our metric will ultimately be is the uh, number of navigation meters you are uh, from the target. So uh, when the question is answered, you're at some node, and you have a fixed distance d to the target. You perform some navigation actions. We measure d prime, and then the metric is just uh, d minus d prime. How, how much progress did you make towards the goal? Yeah. Yes? You're still predicting the action sequences, right? That's correct, yes. So the paradigm is, is identical to the room-to-room -room setup, where at every time step you predict an action, get a new visual uh, frame from the environment, and then predict another action until you decide to stop. That's correct. Yeah, same action space, same setup. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, one of the things we did in the VNLA paper was we imposed a budget on the number of times the, I mean, we, we didn't have nice dialogue, right? We were using template and Laura yeah. replied in templates uh, because it just had full access to the state space. Yes, and it means um, you can have much bigger data set. <laughs> right, and then uh, one of the things was, well, the navigator should not like annoy the Oracle, right? Because it, it, it immediately will learn that if you don't impose a budget, that hey, I get ex extra yeah. information. Language is rich, so there's a lot, as you pointed out, like, you know, there's a lot of, just with language I can, do everything, so I, I should just ask the Oracle. Oracle will tell me more information, higher right. language. So, um, is is there a notion, or or what's your thoughts on like you know um, how much should I do dialogue versus just execute to go towards the goal? Mm -hmm. So, at inference time, as an agent, this becomes an issue. It becomes something we have to think about. For the purposes of data collection, if we have humans stand in for agents, we already have pretty strong social like interaction that forces us not to do the thing where you take one step and ask another question, right? right. The Turkers are self-incentivized because they want to finish as fast as possible and get paid. Right. And also there's a social incentive. Like there are some dialogues that when I was doing annotations where the navigator was asking too many questions and the oracle would start saying like, look, do exactly what I tell you to do, <laughs> then stop and ask another question. Don't stop and ask every, there's one like talking in all caps. It's right. very, the oracle yeah. is annoying, right? that's right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, but in the agent, the agent will yes. So the agent needs to learn. Uh, um, part of this is just like metrics. Um, I'm pretty sure a solid metric for evaluating on an actual two agent version of this task is something like um, success over path length over number of questions asked, right. which is if you can do it without asking questions, awesome. Ask mm -hmm. as few as possible. Everyone penalizes you. Yeah. Yes. So the two of us were paid per task. Mm -hmm. Did you consider the possibility of paying more? I did, but Boda 3 just got deprecated and I did not want to like learn the new library to do the bonusing. So instead, I cultivated a set of Turkers that were happy to be underpaid, um, which sounds horrible, but they emailed me for like two weeks afterwards being like, are you going to put up more hits? We really like these hits, even though like on all of the Turk websites we're rated as like not paying very well. People like it. It's fun. It's a lot more fun than like writing image captions, right? Or filling surveys. Yes. If you're getting more than one history, uh, like maybe potentially many histories from one dialogue, mm -hmm. um, could a model be prone to sort of like overfitting to memorizing what the history is? Um, Especially for long dialogues, yes, this could be an issue. So there's for one, there's overrepresentation of long dialogues because of this task splitting. Yeah, um, that kind of thing affects test time performance no matter what. But you can imagine ameliorating it at training time by only sampling, you know, in instances from any given dialogue um, to try to control for it. Uh, but yeah, we will see that it allows some unimodal advantage, but still not as much as what's present in room to room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Better understand the task. So at each round, the navigator is selecting a question from a list of questions, or it is actually generating the questions? Um, no. So this is all based on the data set collected from human human. So what's happening is at every task instance, there exists some dialogue history that humans had and the agent has a starting node that it's on, and conditioned on the history that's happened so far, it just has to try to get to the goal node. So in this particular task, there's no question asking. I'll talk in the future work about um, generating questions and answers as well, which is obviously like something I'd really like to do with the data set as well. Yeah. Cool. 
Um, I'm going to move on in the interest of time, but we uh, do an initial sequence to sequence model based on the model from room to room that exhibited unimodal issues. Uh, the simplest thing we can do is just feed in the target, the hint. So if we say the target object is a mat, start moving, um, we'll probably not do a very good job. Uh, we need to at least include what the oracle just told us to do. So if the oracle said, yeah, head up the stairs, and our, it, this is hard to see because it's small, but there's some stairs right in front of us. All we need is this. Head up the stairs is sufficient to do the navigation in this case. Um, you may think that's almost always true, but in the data set we found a decent portion of cases where if you don't have the question, you're toast. Like here, the navigator basically says the navigation they should do, and the oracle responds, yeah. If you condition on yeah, you're definitely not going to turn left down the hallway ahead, right? So we can also consider the last question that was asked. And here we need to tag the navigator is speaking. Here's the navigator's tokens. Now the oracle is speaking oracle tokens. And these are all learned embeddings. Um, probably this is enough, yeah? But again, real dialogue from the data set. The oracle describes this long sequence of things the navigator should do that includes go to the left door next to two yellow lights. And then the navigator gets lost. They do the wrong thing for a while. And eventually they find the yellow lights. And they're like, oh, hey, are these the yellow lights you were talking about? To resolve this reference, we're actually going to need to look back a couple question answer exchanges. So let's just encode all of it um, and hope for the best, right? This is the simplest thing we could do. So we'll ablate each of these uh, in turn, but intuitively, like having the whole dialogue history should help if we can afford to not catastrophically forget what's important, uh, which is part of why the target object comes last. So, Sorry, yes. Does this include attention on. Yeah, so the initial model uh, includes at every decoder step, there's also a soft attention over the uh, states of the LSTM encoder, which is part of why this is even remotely uh, reasonable to do. Yes, good point. Uh, so we evaluate on uh, two things, the validation set and the test set. The validation set is houses that we're, we've seen at training time, but new dialogues. So there's a reasonable expectation that we could memorize the visual environment and do a better job at path memorization. So this is a really difficult challenge, especially against unimodal baselines. Um, on the x-axis here, I'll show performance uh, based on what input we give to the encoder. And then on the y-axis is progress towards the goal. With the target object, you do pretty well. Um, a little bit further than what the oracle actually saw, actually. And then if you add the last question, you get a bump. Add the last answer, another bump. Now we're doing well over what the oracle was actually shown. So we are mimicking human exploration in these environments. Uh, and if we add all the dialogue history, uh, it goes down a little bit. But that's okay. In general, we see a trend that adding at least the last question answer context is helpful for performing the navigation, right? At least in scene environments. But the real question is like, if we're in a house that we've never been in before, like we're a hospital robot dropped in a new ward, or we're an office robot that accidentally took the elevator, how are we gonna perform navigation? So this is novel dialogues in never before seen houses. And again, target object, we're now making a whopping two hops of progress almost. Um, so we are moving towards the goal on average, but that's about all we can say. Uh, as we add the last answer, that improves. Last question, nice big improvement. And adding all dialogue history helps even more because we can sort of look back far enough to get context and, and move in the right direction. So in unseen environments, we find that adding full dialogue history is helpful for performing navigation. And this sort of tracks with our intuition that language becomes more important if you can't rely as much on your visual environment. So we compare against our unimodal baselines. So this is, this is our trial by fire. This is our model uh, using language and vision on validation environments in blue and unseen test environments in gold. Uh, we first compare against an action-only baseline, uh, which performs way better than random, but still really poorly. On average, it goes one step towards the right direction uh, still, which is just like, don't walk towards the wall. Um, the vision-only baseline performs quite well. You'll note, especially in validation environments that are seen before, we can just memorize them. Photorealistic or not, if you're in a place you've been before, vision is going to be a really strong component is the takeaway there. Uh, compared to the language-only baseline, though, which you'll recall in the original room-to-room -room data was more powerful than the full model, um, we do considerably better adding language and vision. There's, there's a, um, a nice jump in performance. The initial model uh, actually uses the multimodal input is what we can conclude from this. It's not just over-parameterized in the unimodal case. Does this mean that the vision part is not learning any long-term context of spatial layouts? I think, that's a, I think that's a fair thing to assume is kind of happening here, yeah. Especially because it's just taking the ResNet embedding. It's not learning really like, okay, this region of the image contains the Christmas tree that's being discussed. What it's getting is like, you know, the softmax classifier at the end of ResNet will probably think there's a tree in the scene, right? What if you, what if you put those ResNet outputs 
also as a sequence like you did in language so that it learns what is expected next in layouts. As an attempt to do prediction? Yeah. It could work. I mean, some of these uh, actual tasks for room to room do like autoencoder style, like try to predict what you're going to see next, and that tends to improve the visual recognition a lot. Again, the only reason we fall back to the room to room initial model is for this comparison that we can demonstrate that we're no longer uh, subject to this unimodal bias that was present in the original data set. Yeah. But definitely there are more nuanced models we should uh, tackle for this. Which brings us to headroom. Um, this is what the shortest path planner would do. So there's lots of distance for more nuanced models uh, to do this kind of like fine tuning both for vision and for more coherent language context. So quick lessons, adding more dialogue history helps, especially in unseen environments. Uh, unimodal baselines are important to run, you should always do it. Uh, but this model does seem to take, uh, make use of both vision and language to do a good job, especially again in unseen environments where the vision hasn't been able to overfit to the houses it's been in before. And there's headroom for more nuance, which we'll talk about in our next steps. One coherent thing would just be to incorporate the dialogue history or the navigation history. So we're given all the questions and answers so far, but intuitively we also know where the agent has walked in the past and you don't want to turn around and like backtrack on your own path minimally. Um, and there are also things in the dialogue where oracles say things like, oh, you were there briefly but left. There's a turntable behind you into the bedroom next to it. And here what we really want to do is like attend to our navigation history and say, okay, there's the bedroom that I was last in. That's where the goal is and just turn around and go there. You don't really need the rest of the instruction, right? So being able to see our previous steps and then try to align them um, with some kind of soft attention uh, during encoding would be a nice like initial next step. Um, in general, in this talk, I've talked about one particular task we can do for CVDN, which is replacing in human-human dialogues the navigation component with a robot to perform the navigation, an agent that learns to do it. Um, you can also imagine, uh, as some people brought up, uh, learning to ask the questions given navigation so far, or learning to answer questions. Uh, so if somebody asks you, you know, how do I get to Jesse's talk? You'd really like it if Pepper told you the answer. Um, but when I looked at it earlier today, it was off-duty, so I couldn't try. <laughs> And ultimately what we'd like to do is replace all of them with robots, right? Uh, we'd like to have agents that can navigate and ask questions and agents that can answer questions. And we can use this data set to bootstrap this kind of two agent system uh, where you're given the hint and you have to do environmental exploration, sort of self play to have the agents maybe evolve their own language, which is terminology I really don't like, but like it's popular in the RL community. And that really starts to look like what we're going to have to use to solve this two agent problem. Um, so again, Bringing robots from industrial environments into human environments is already happening. Like they're, they're being deployed and we need to consider the various challenges that go into that. And for my part, I'm interested in the natural language and navigation and unseen environments p pieces of that challenge. And I'm happy that roboticists are doing things like safety and perception because it's much harder to do hardware. So high level takeaways for vision and language navigation, always run unimodal ablations. They expose data set bias and uh, issues with your parameterization and your model. For vision and dialogue navigation, uh, cooperative dialogue gives us a mix of high-level language in the form of hints and low-level language on a step-by-step -step basis. That means we're not weak to unimodal bias anymore. And using dialogue context helps with doing a straightforward navigation task that looks like the ones that are popular already, like room to room. Um, so the two papers are online. Uh, there's shifting the baseline at NACL this year about unimodal bias. And then uh, this new paper, vision and dialogue navigation, is on archive. Um, we introduced this new data set. It's available online. You can check out the data and the code here. If you want to check out for any remaining questions and answers, you can open that uh, tab uh, here to play as navigator or oracle. Um, if enough of you connect at the same time, you'll actually end up playing with each other. Or you can just do two, like I do, to test it myself. And we introduced the navigation or dialogue history task, which I'm in talks with Eval AI for setting up a leaderboard for. So that should be up in the next couple of weeks. Thanks, everybody. Let's see. Yeah, like in, like in AI to Thor, like the interaction where you're doing tasks and opening drawers and... Okay, tasks. I'll play it. <laughs> so I'm working on something that looks a bunch like this, where we have high-level instructions, like 
put a slice of bread in the microwave, which you'll be able to see when the loading is done. Um, and this has both navigation and interaction with the environment, so pick and place, open, close. Uh, so we'd like to be able to train agents that can like navigate through a kitchen to find tools. So in this case, we've got to go find a knife so we can slice some bread, find some bread so we can slice it, and then take the slice to the microwave, which has to be found, open it, throw the bread in, then we're done. Um, I don't have dialogue for this. I'm not planning on gathering it. What I am gathering is low-level instructions uh, that are sort of semantically plausible given the plan, like turn around and walk to the sink, pick up the knife, walk to the bread on the counter, slice the bread, turn around and walk to the microwave on the far side of the room, right? Which you could use to simulate a dialogue interaction similar to what was done in your VLNA paper, where there are coherent points where you're allowed to ask for help. Yeah. Will you also have uh, the, the action of seemingly performing the action but not actually doing it? So I, I, I pretend to pick up the knife, but I don't. So that, you know, you in mean the just system to, you can verify, you have some verification whether the action was done or not, actually? Sure. We don't plan to cook, cook that in now, but there's conceptually nothing stopping from adding some parameters just to help with, like, detect that your action actually failed, right? Um, it's obviously simplest to assume if you issue an a API command that it succeeds, yeah. but okay. it's relatively straightforward, at least in this framework, to say, like, you know, 80% of the time it succeeds, 20% do nothing instead, right? Just replacing with no ops. And detecting and recovering from that probably makes models more robust, right? Mm -hmm.